Um, welcome to the 2018 Kundal Lecture, and I'm Professor Faith Wallace from the Department of History and Classical Studies. The Kundal Lecture is one of the events connected with the Kundal Prize and supported by the Kundal Foundation through the endowment of the late Peter Kundal, who received his commerce degree from McGill in 1960. Peter Kundal was a businessman, an adventurer, and a lover of history and the historian's craft. And each year, we invite the winner of the previous year's Kundal Prize, which is awarded for the best book on history published in English that year, to deliver the Kundal Lecture. The winner of the Kundal Prize in 2017 was Dr. Daniel Beer of Royal Holloway, University of London, who's our lecturer tonight. And I'm particularly happy that so many people involved in making the events of Kundal Week possible are here this evening, but I want to pay special tribute to a few notable stalwarts particularly to Dean Antonia Maioni of the Faculty of Arts for enthusiastic support and her many creative ideas for making all of the Kundal events more exciting. To Catherine McRae and Neely McDonald, who's charted the course and kept us on course. Uh, and of course, to Shamim uh, Muradun and Aaron Henson of History and uh, Classical Studies Administrative Hub for keeping us on course, uh, getting us away from all those rocks and reefs. There's a number of other people as well too, and I'd particularly like to commend, uh, uh, to uh, say special thanks to the Russian Studies uh, section of the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures who helped us support our noontime seminar with Dr. Beer uh, and who uh, have been very enthusiastic about this. Really, the Kundal Prize is belongs to the whole faculty, indeed, to the whole university, and it's nice to see uh, so many people getting involved. Um, after the lecture, there'll be opportunity for a uh, question and answer. Uh, this lecture is being recorded and filmed. So if you do have a question, can I ask you to step up to the microphone? And those who have questions, just form a line behind the first person who gets to the microphone. Uh, and we'll have a question and answer for you know a decent interval of time. And when the interval of time gets indecent, we will call an end to it. I will ask uh, P Professor Pertz from the Russian Studies program to come and say a few closing words, and then we can adjourn downstairs to the dining room where there is a reception. There's also a table manned by the staff of Paragraph Books where you can buy copies of Professor Beer's book, uh, and I'm sure he'd autograph them for you. Uh, but yeah, so bear that in mind. Peter Kundal's dedication to history not only extended to rewarding the current generation of outstanding historians, but also to forming the next generation of outstanding historians through the Kundal Doctoral Fellowships. Our Kundal Doctoral Fellow in the Department of History and Classical Studies this year is Lee Parent, and I'm gonna ask Lee to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you all, first of all, for coming out on this rather cold mid-November night. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Daniel Beer. Dr. Beer is a reader at Royal Holloway University of London and the author of numerous articles on 19th century Russia, including such topics as society, politics, socio-medical topics, as well as the book Renovating Russia, The Human Sciences and the Fate of Liberal Modernity, 1880 to 1930. Hopefully for many of you, this is a second introduction since Dr. Beer was generous enough to treat us to a lunchtime talk on civil death, radical protest, and the theater of punishment under Alexander II. From a number of people I've talked to who were able to make it to this talk, this was a conversation that was as challenging to norms in scholarship as his book that he's going to use to draw on themes for tonight's talk, The House of the Dead, Colonization and Punishment in Tsarist Siberia. This talk draws on themes from his 2016 House of the Dead, Siberian Exile under the Tsars, shortlisted for the Wolfson Prize, the Pushkin House, Russian Book Prize, the Longman History Today Book Prize, and of course, winner of last year's Kundal Prize. For what I imagine is a much more relaxing evening before the Kundal Awards ceremony tomorrow, if you could please join me in welcoming Dr. Beer. Um, thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here as a guest of um, Miguel University and of course the Kundil Foundation. Um, and uh, it's a great honor to be giving uh, this year's Kundil Prize um, lecture in history. Although I do face the, I think, ludicrously daunting task of trying to do justice in the next 
50 minutes to the um, to the accolade I had heaped on me last year. Um, so I I, uh, I hope that you don't go away um, disappointed. Um, what I'll try to do is pull out the sort of two the two principal themes um, which um, animate uh, the book um, and try to give you a, a sort of a sense of of why why I I, I found the topic so. Uh, fascinating to uh, to research uh, and to um, to write about. Um, in the spring of 1591, uh, the nine-year-old son and designated heir of Ivan the Terrible, Tsarevich Dmitri, was found in the town of Uglich with his throat slit. Dmitri's mother and her family believe that the Tsarevich had been murdered on the orders of a potential rival to the throne, the Tsar regent, Boris Godunov. They rang Uglich's bell to summon the townspeople in revolt. The Uglichans formed a mob and went on the rampage, murdering both the presumed assassins and an official from Moscow. This unrest drew the Kremlin's wrath. Godunov ordered forces to Uglich to quash the rebellion, and the following spring, he dispensed justice. He had some 200 townspeople imprisoned and, and sorry, executed and others imprisoned. About 100 were flogged and had their nostrils torn out. The more eloquent lost their tongues as well. Scourged and mutilated, the rebels were banished to Siberia. In inflicting retribution on the insurgents, however, Godunov also punished the symbol of their political unity. He had the bell lowered subjected to 12 lashes, relieved of its tongue, and exiled to Siberia. The Uglichans were then made to drag the mutinous bell across the Urals before finally bringing it to rest in Taborsk, where the town's military governor registered it as the first inanimate exile. <laughs> Silenced and banished, the bell became a testament to the power of Russia's rulers, both to drive their unruly subjects beyond the Urals and to strike them dumb. Yet in the centuries that followed, it also became a rallying point for opponents uh, of the autocracy who viewed Godunov's punishment of the Uglichans as the cruel act of a usurper. In 1862, one nobleman exiled to Taborsk discerned in the bell of Uglich, quote, an unquelled accuser who bears eloquent testimony to the punishment of an entire blameless town. The bell had come then to symbolize not only the supreme authority of the sovereign, but also the vengeful power on which it relied. In the century before the Russian Revolution, nearly one million Tsarist subjects were exiled across the Urals to various locations throughout the Siberian landmass in a state-sponsored project of penal colonization. So my book examines their experiences. It's partly a work of social history, but it also investigates the impact of the exile system on the political culture of the Russian Empire and on the emergence of the revolutionary movement. So this slide just gives you a sense of the scale. So um, Siberia is uh, one and a half times the size of Europe. So everywhere westwards from the Urals, um, if we count that as, as Europe, um, Siberia uh, extends one and a half times uh, that, that territory um, to, the, to the east. Colonization had already given imperial policies in Siberia a wider purpose in the reign of Catherine the Great, but exile remained chaotic, and it was driven by the ad hoc accumulation of edicts, laws, and temporary legislation. It was rationalized for the first time under the reforming energies of the great 19th century statesman Mikhail Speransky, who set about streamlining the exile system. In 1822, Speransky implemented a raft of reforms that marked the beginning of the imperial state's coordinated and sustained pursuit of the penal colonization of Siberia. Henceforth, exiles convicted of major crimes were sentenced to varying terms of penal labor followed by exile to settlement to a particular district in Siberia, less serious offenders were sentenced directly to various terms ranging from a few years to their entire lives of exile to settlement, again within a particular district. Upon completion of these sentences, 
exiles were permitted to leave their officially designated district and to reside anywhere in Siberia. Both punishments then, penal labor or exile to settlement, envisage the eventual integration of the exiles into the ranks of the Siberian peasantry. Exiles were only allowed to return to European Russia if the authorities granted them express permission and an internal passport to do so. They were obliged to secure the consent of their own peasant or merchant communities, which was often not forthcoming, and they had to pay for the return journey themselves. The legal barriers to the uh, return of the exiles to their native regions after they had served out their sentences were deliberately calculated to ensure that most remained in Siberia. The state's colonial project beyond the Urals in the post-reform, so there are some, I'm, when I'm, post I'm talking about the great reforms of the reign of Alexander II, uh, this colonial project rested really on three planks. The deportation, the territorial control, and the rehabilitation of the exile population. And in each of these areas, there was a chronic gulf between the state's designs and its ability to implement them. The Tsarist authorities failed to administer efficiently the penal migration of hundreds of thousands of exiles and their families eastwards. It also failed to ensure that they remained tied to the territories in which they were assigned, and it failed to promote their integration into the wider settler population of Siberia as independent and productive colonists. Setting out from collection points across the Russian Empire, exiles would be funneled through Tabolsk in Western Siberia, where the exile office uh, would determine their final destination. From Tabolsk, exiles would march a staggering 1,600 kilometers to the city of Tomsk over a 12-week period with never more than a single, day's, uh, uh, a single day of consecutive rest in, in way stations that were strung out along the route. Another 600 kilometers stood between Tomsk and Krasnoyarsk on the Yenisei River, the boundary between Western and Eastern Siberia, where the prisoners would be allowed to rest for a week. After another 1,000 kilometers of marching, again with no more than a single consecutive day's rest, the convoy would uh, eventually reach Irkutsk and another few days of precious respite. The final leg was no less arduous. Penal laborers destined for the silver mines of Nerchinsk had another 1,600 kilometers to march. So according to Speransky's calculations, an exile on reaching Irkutsk would have walked 3,600 kilometers, the approximate distance overland from Madrid to St. Petersburg or from Washington DC to Salt Lake City, Utah in 30 weeks at an average distance of 27 kilometers per day. So from the lofty heights of St. Petersburg's ministries, Speransky had crafted a virtual world of orderly timetable departures and arrivals, efficient convoy commands working in synchronized harmony to deliver their charges to Siberia's destinations along a meticulously planned route. From this altitude, plotting the forced migration of, a, of people was a matter of slotting numbers together in a coherent sequence. Rubles per convict, convict per marching convoy, way stations per hundreds of kilometers, and so on. Yet the remote and recalcitrant realities of Siberia subverted Spiransky's imperial ambitions, confounding his attempts to micromanage this traffic in human beings. The convoys themselves were processions of misfortune. At the front marched the penal laborers. Those sentenced not simply to exile but to penal labor were considered, for the most part with good cause, to be more dangerous and more likely to attempt an escape. Their hands were manacled and they wore heavy leg fetters connected by a chain that ran through a string attached to a belt. They were then shackled in pairs to a pole, later replaced by a chain, to prevent escapes. When one collapsed, all had to stop. When one had to defecate, all had to attend. Following them tramped those exiled to settlement wearing only leg fetters. Next came the administrative exiles, so those, th those who'd been exiled um, extrajudicially by the state, uh, and they were not shackled. 
And the final group can comprise family members voluntarily following their relatives into exile. Behind the column rumbled four carts, each drawn by a single horse. These bore the exile's belongings. Their lives were condensed into a maximum weight of 12 kilograms. If space allowed, the old, the young, and the sick were permitted to ride with the baggage. If not, they could hire extra horse-drawn carts from local villages or at their, at their own expense. If they did not have the funds, they had to walk. The venality of the Siberian authorities subverted the attempts of the central uh, government to enforce oversight and accountability throughout the deportation system. Speransky had envisaged the Taborsk exile office as the efficient administrative headquarters of the exile system. It was, in fact, a pit of corruption. By the middle of the century, report after report highlighted cases of embezzlement, the theft of exiles' possessions, and a brisk illicit trade in places of banishment. So if you had money, you could pay to have yourself reassigned to a more, a more congenial location. Deportation convoy officers would make available a daily allowance, or sometimes would simply hand over a given sum when the convoy set out from the way station on a given stage along the route. These funds were almost always insufficient to purchase food from the local villages through which the convoy passed. And the convoy soldiers and their families then charged extortionate prices for breads and supplies at way stations in which they enthusiastically operated monopolies. Such venality frequently proved lethal. To give one example among dozens contained in the archives, in February 1866, 11 convicts froze to death en route from Krasnoyarsk to the Irkutsk prison. Autopsies revealed that their stomachs were completely empty. Moreover, almost none of the convicts had warm clothing, and one of them arrived, in the words of the report, uh, without a shirt in someone else's kaftan under which he had stuffed straw. The survivors testified that they'd been forced to sell their clothing to purchase bread at extortionate prices from the way station soldiers and their families. The way stations and transit prisons themselves were decaying, disease-ridden structures in which exiles and their families were falling sick in large numbers in overcrowded, drafty, and inadequately heated prisons. One senior official reported in 1871 that in eastern Siberia, quote, the majority of the way station buildings are not fit for purpose. They are so cramped and dilapidated. There is no way that basic order in them can be maintained. Sanitation in the transit prisons was dreadful. The cells were poorly heated and ventilated. Exiles struggled for space on the benches. Hardened and aggressive criminals occupied premium positions near the stove in winter and by the windows in summer. The weak and sick were forced to sleep under the benches on the filth-encrusted floors. The way stations were infested with a galaxy of ravenous insects and a strip of wall running above the benches in the cells was usually stained red with the blood of crushed mosquitoes as exile after exile had attempted to put an end to his tormentors. Convicts responded to this brutal and unpredictable environment of the deportation convoys by organizing themselves into an artiel or a prisoner's association for the duration of the journey. Comprised of representatives from groups of approximately 10 prisoners in each convoy, this unofficial but powerful community was effectively a duplication of the communal traditions of the peasant village. It held sway over all aspects of the convicts' lives in the marching convoys. Its primary function was the collective protection of its members against the authorities. And headed by an elected figure, the operation of the artiel were governed by, the tradi by traditions that embraced commercial activity, a central exchequer, and draconian codes of discipline and punishment. Whilst it was not an official institution, the exile administration recognized the existence and the necessity of the artiel. The authorities not only turned a blind eye to many of its illegal practices, but even relied upon its goodwill in order to manage the operation of the convoys. And convoy commanders would disperse responsibilities throughout the marching convoy in extension of 
uh, in exchange for the extension of concessions to all. So, for example, if the, if the uh, prisoners RTL gave an undertaking that no escapes would be attempted along a certain stretch of the route, they might be allowed to remove their uh, fetters. Or they might be, um, in exchange for such a promise, they might be allowed to uh, beg as they made their way through um, villages. One of the RTL's primary responsibilities was the enforcement of contracts from the strictly financial to the very personal between its members. Backed by the threat of violence, it oversaw and indeed made possible the constant bartering of goods and services between convicts. From the repairing of boots to the purchase of vodka, the RTL ensured that undertakings of deferred payment would be honored. Some had only their names and fates to barter. It was quite impossible for convoy commanders to remember each individual's face, and at the changeover from one, one stage command to another, only the overall number of convicts was counted. There was no roll call. Such laxity in record keeping presented an opportunity to determined and unscrupulous exiles. Wily, hardened criminals would trick naive and destitute exiles into swapping their names and fates in exchange for a few rubles or a bottle of vodka. Anyone attempting to renege on such agreements would incur the wrath, I mean, they could very often be um, fatal punishment beatings um, at the hands of the Artil. Whether assigned to villages as settlers or to mines and factories as penal laborers, exiles were tied to certain localities in the interests of Siberia's penal colonization. The control of population movement reflected in laws criminalizing vagrancy and of course in the very institution of serfdom was a cornerstone of the autocracy. And yet the state's control of its own exile population in Siberia proved extremely tenuous. A bird's eye view of the taiga in the 19th century would have revealed a steady trickle of figures stooped under heavy bundles, trudging westwards either alone or in small groups. The hunchbacks, as the peasants called them, were escaped convicts who had fled the marching convoys, the mines, the prisons and the penal settlements and were making their way across the forests in the direction of European Russia answering the spring call of the migrant cuckoo and taking advantage of the warmer weather, thawed waterways and thickening vegetation that provided them with camouflage and with food, the fugitives set forth. These were the foot soldiers of what was known as General Cuckoo's Army. The Siberian authorities proved unable even to contain exiles within the specific penal forts and settlements, let alone press them into orderly and productive labor. Officials struggled to prevent escapes of penal laborers from ramshackle and poorly guarded prisons and penal forts, and they were completely powerless to stop exile settlers assigned to particular villages from simply upping sticks and walking off into the forests. Branding proved an ineffective means of identifying fugitives as exiles found inventive um, and indescribably painful ways of removing the brands, and the brutal floggings that were meted out to captured fugitives and extensions to their, their, their sentences failed to, to deter repeat offenders and indeed only increased the incentive to flee once again. So one of the ambitions was if you were, if you were a penal laborer sentenced to 20, 20 years of penal labor um, and you escaped, um, at the moment when you were captured, you would do everything possible to pass yourself off as someone who had, I mean, ideally pass yourself off as, as a vagrant or a religious pilgrim, but if that failed, you would try to pass yourself off as someone who had been sentenced for a much shorter crime, so a much, a much shorter put sentence. So someone who had been administratively exiled by his village for sort of improper conduct, was this very um, elastic term that was used um, for a term of four or five years. Um, and there are sort of quite, quite uh, almost comic encounters between uh, the authorities trying to work out, trying to establish the actual identity of uh, veteran fugitives who have become extremely accomplished in this sort of, these counterfeit uh, identities that they have uh, crafted. The numbers of fugitives told a sobering tale. 
abandoned and imprisoned in penury and squalor, and with quite literally nothing to lose, Siberia's convicts absconded from every single prison, factory, settlement, and mine in their thousands. One government report into the state of exile in eastern Siberia in 1877 recorded that of three districts surveyed in Irkutsk province, 11,000 out of a to total of 23,000 had run away, their whereabouts unknown. By 1898, 25% of the exiles, that's 11,000 uh, assigned to Yenisei province, and 40% of the 30,000 assigned to Irkutsk province in eastern Siberia were unaccounted for. Purpose-built prison uh, penal labor sites witnessed a similar exodus. So it, by the, by the, in the last quarter of the 19th century, anywhere up to a third of Siberia's 300,000 exiles were on the run in what the ethnographer Nikolai Yadrinsev termed an endless perpetuum mobile from, the east, from eastern Siberia to the Urals. Desperate and deracinated, these fugitives transformed Siberia into Russia's wild east. As the governor of Western Siberia, Nikolai Kaznakov lamented in 1877, the exile the population bound together in the misery of its circumstances and by the solidarity of its interests has virtually forged an alliance extending across all of Siberia, which is conducting a secret war against the civilian population. Merchant caravans, the lifeblood of Siberian commerce, were especially vulnerable to assault as they made their way through thick forests along Siberia's isolated roads. Highwaymen were so active along the Great Siberian Post Road between uh, Irkutsk and Tomsk that in 1886, coachmen took to heavily arming themselves and riding in large groups to improve their chances of fighting off the bandits. Several of the worst stretches of road had to be patrolled by mounted Cossacks. And in a world in which the theft of livestock and farming implements could bring utter destitution to, pe to peasant families, retribution was brutal. Captured thieves were subject to violent and often fatal public beatings. Over the course of 1844, uh, 1884, the town surgeon in Ishim, which is a relatively small district uh, near Ir Irkutsk, conducted no fewer than 200 post-mortems on the bodies of fugitive exiles murdered by uh, peasants in his district alone. Unable to cope with the numbers of fugitives at large in the Siberian forests, the authorities re resorted to advertising rewards to bounty hunters or to simply turning a blind eye to the vagabonds who wandered the roads and forests and even tolerated the emergence of hostels in cities like Tomsk that offered refuge to escaped exiles. So in, in Tomsk, uh, they buy, uh, by the middle of the 1880s, um, the city governor is actually uh, instructing his police force to stop arresting uh, fugitive exiles because they simply don't have the capacity to uh, accommodate any more uh, prisoners in the city. By the end of, sorry, by the middle of the 19th uh, century, the rehabilitation of convicts was also declared to be a central humane goal of the exile system. This commitment to rehabilitation was embedded in the incentives offered penal laborers. If they maintained good behavior, which in practice meant the avoidance of further punishments in Siberia, they were, after a period uh, of time ranging from a few to a dozen years, depending on the severity of their original sentence, permitted to live beyond the confines of the prison to remove their fetters and so forth. And at the conclusion of this term, they were released to settlement and then ultimately allowed to join the ranks of the Siberian peasantry. The full-blown colonization of the continent required the establishment of economically productive settled communities which would promote commerce, culture, and development. And government exiles were not blind, however, to the obvious challenges in converting criminal exiles into resilient and law-abiding settlers. Faithful to the paternalist culture of the autocracy, they turned with a mixture of idealism and pragmatism to the family. The state encouraged women to follow their husbands into exile, believing that their presence would exert a pacifying and reforming influence over the men. Through the establishment of 
stable and productive family units, individual regeneration neatly dovetailed with the state's colonial agenda. So actually, the um, women are incentivized, um, and by 18, the 1830s, um, um, women, the, the, the wives of state uh, peasants who had been exiled are actually forced um, to follow their husbands uh, to uh, Siberia. The exile system remained, however, beset by a chronic gender imbalance. Women made the journey to Siberia more frequently as the spouses of convicts rather than as convicts themselves. And the numbers of families joining penal laborers increased as the opening of river routes, sea routes, and railway lines simplified and accelerated the journey into exile in the closing decades of the 19th century. Of the 230,000 individuals who entered Siberia through the exile office between 1882 and 1898, 65% were men, 10% were women, and 25% were children. The Tsarist regime's attempt to establish a penal colony on the island of uh, Sakhalin. Actually, sorry, I have, uh, so Sakhalin, I've been told I should show you on this. Uh, Sakhalin is over here, if you can, is that not terribly um, legible at this distance? Um, the uh, colony on Sakhalin graphically illustrates the failure of the state's attempts to devolve the rehabilitation of convicts onto the patriarchal institution of the family. The numbers of convicts arriving on the island uh, in, in each year increased rapidly from an initial trickle in the 1870s to several hundred per annum in the mid-1880s and to more than 1,000 every year by the end of that decade. There were about 6,000 penal laborers and 4,000 settled exiles on the island in 1890, and by the time of the empire-wide census of 1897, the total exile population had swelled to 22,000. About 2,000 women on the island were female convicts, and another 1,300 were free status women, meaning they were wives who'd followed their husbands into exile, or they were the peasant offspring of exiles. These women shared the island with 16,000 adult males, and so constituted only a fifth of the total exile population. When women exiles reached Sakhalin, they were treated not as frontier domesticators, but as habitual prostitutes. The camp administration even organized the sale of their bodies. Sakhalin's chief physician, Dr. Leonid Podubsky, observed how, upon arrival on the island, female penal laborers were lusted after and molested by warders and soldiers who demanded sex from them. And he even encountered cases where a husband and a wife, sentenced together to penal labor on Sakhalin for the same crime, would arrive at different times of the year, only for the woman to be given to a different settler. A woman on Sakhalin becomes, another of the physicians on the island, uh, Dr. Nikolai Lobas, commented, an object in the full sense of the word, an object that can be handed over, dispatched, received, borrowed. Women were indeed passed around from one exile to the next in a series of squalid transactions arranged by the authorities, sometimes for personal profit. And the free status wives of exiles fared little better, sometimes even worse. Struggling in conditions of absolute penury, even faithful free status wives maintained their families through prostitution. Exiles would begin to sell their daughters from the age of 12. Anyone who has a good-looking wife and daughter makes a decent living here, one exile explained, and doesn't need to bother with livestock. Released to settlement at the conclusion of their terms of penal labor, the exiles found themselves under-resourced in a harsh and inhospitable climate. Isolated, impoverished, indebted to the state, and equipped with poorly made tools, Sakhalin's involuntary colonists toiled for a time to no discernible effect before finally sinking into hungry destitution. With a journalist flair for the pithy um, epithet, Vlast Darashevich coined the aphorism, penal labor starts when it ends. If they survived their ordeal as exiled settlers, the convicts on Sakhalin, as elsewhere in Siberia, were permitted to join the ranks of the Siberian peasantry. 
And the government initially refused the exiles the right to return to the mainland and obliged them to engage in agriculture on the island until they had settled all the debts they had accumulated in state subsidies. From 1894, when such restrictions were lifted, the numbers returning to Russia each year soared, from 220 in 1894 to 2000 in 1898. Some 758 farms were abandoned on Sakhalin in 1899 alone in what the authorities acknowledged to be a mass migration of settlers and peasants. So the devolution then of central state power to a host of subordinate feudal and religious institutions from the landed gentry to peasant communities was a tried and tested form of governance in Imperial Russia. But in the sprawling territories of Siberia, the power of the Imperial state was not bolstered, but dramatically undercut by its reliance on subordinate groups to provision, administer, police, and even rehabilitate the exiles. The families of convoy officers, prisoners associations, bounty hunters, and the destitute and desperate families of the exiles themselves all proved unreliable and subversive adjuncts of state power. There was a persistent gulf between imperial ambition and administrative command. Already in the late 1870s, some in the central government were acknowledging that far from being an important plank in the government's wider plans for the colonization of the continent, the exile system had emerged as an enormous obstacle to it. So actually, what, what, one of the things that I, I, I found surprising, um, it might have just be an expression of my own um, naivety, but um, it was really how clear-sighted the regime was. I mean, sort of the ministers, uh, inspectors, regional governors, how clear-sighted they were about the um, endemic failings of the exile system. So it was really like watching a car crash in slow motion from, from the 1830s right through to the turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, and it was understood that this was a system which lacked a sort of, you know, lacked a, a defensible juridical foundation. Um, some some forty percent of all exiles uh, reached Siberia, having never seen the inside of a courtroom. They'd been um, exiled administratively by their merchant guilds or by their their, their peasant uh, communes. Many of them were just victims of 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 um, intrigue. Um, or the sort of the cauldron of um, village uh, politics. And um, it, it, was the, it was the fact that the regime understands the problems, but lacks the, it lacks the kind of the administrative wherewithal and it lacked the financial resources to embark upon um, the alternative, which was a construction of, of, of um, modern, modern prisons in European Russia uh, itself. Um, which sort of shackled it to a form of punishment that was effectively um, depleting um, the sort of the moral authority uh, of the of the autocracy um, almost by the year. Beyond colonization, though, the exile system also served another important purpose, that of containment. From its earliest recorded instances, Siberia had served as a zone of political quarantine. Think back to the, the uprising in Uglich, uh, into which dissidents and revolutionaries could be cast. The Decembrist officers from the failed revolt of 1825, Polish insurgents in the 1830s, and young socialists like Fyodor Dostoevsky in the 1850s were effectively expelled from the body politic and into an oblivion of sorts. But there was a profound shift in the second half of the 19th century. The expansion of print media began to publicize the fate of exiles, not only in Russia, but around the world, creating a profound public relations dilemma for the authorities. Secondly, a new generation of revolutionaries were no longer content, as the Decembrists, for example, had been, to act out their political commitments within the narrow confines of their exile communities. Instead, they sought to continue their struggle against the state in Siberia's penal settlements and prisons. And they did so initially 
by crafting heroic and inspiring narratives of martyrdom at the hands of a tyrannical regime, narratives that were designed to rally supporters to the revolutionary cause. So I, I, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, um, the, uh, this particular region here, uh, so Trans-Baikal, Trans so the region um, to the east of Lake uh, Baikal, which is uh, here. Between the assassination of Alexander II in 1881 and the outbreak of uh, the 1905 revolution, the state exiled around 4,000 individuals for political crimes, some to penal labor and others to administrative exile. The numbers were not great when contrasted with the 300,000 exiles in Siberia by 1898. Yet they mattered much less uh, than the, 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 the numbers mattered much less than the influence and the standing of men and women who found themselves now caught up in the government's dragnet. The Governor General of Eastern Siberia, Dmitry Anuchin, observed that the politicals were, with only a few exceptions, drawn from the educated classes and were notable for their initiative, decisiveness, and the close bonds and capacity for concerted action that bind them together. The perceived mistreatment of individuals could quickly spiral into collective confrontation with officials. The authorities found themselves locked into cycles of retaliation and escalation, which they could only win through the imposition of brute force. But for a government trying to shore up its moral authority in an age of a flourishing, if still censored, regional and national press, such tactics were not without risk. So this is um, uh, the Nerchinsk mining district. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, what I'm about to discuss uh, takes place here uh, in uh, Kara, so um, very close to the, um, the Chinese border. One particularly dramatic episode in this escalating conflict between the revolutionaries and the exile authorities took place in the women's prison at Kara in Transbaikal in 1889, where a group of women prisoners embarked on a hunger strike in protest at the treatment of one of their comrades. So there's sort of an extended um, sort of battle of wills between the prison officials um, who kept on introducing food into the cells in an attempt to sort of seduce uh, these desperately hungry women uh, into eating, and the women would try to, you know, try to kind of hold their hold their nerve. But you know, many many of them would actually um, sort of give in um, and begin to consume food. So they they sort of felt that they were getting uh, nowhere. And at that moment, one so this this is the prison in um, in Kara. This is the women's prison. One of the Kara prisoners, uh, Natalia Sigida, who was serving an eight-year sentence of penal labor for operating an underground printing press, initiated a dramatic escalation in the conflict. Recognizing that the women would not succeed through their hunger strike in forcing concessions from the authorities, she requested a meeting with the head of the prison, Masyukov, at the end of August 1889. Admitted into his office, Sigida walked up to Masyukov and slapped him in the face. In what had become, for both the revolutionaries and the prison officials, an attritional contest over moral authority and political legitimacy, striking a senior prison official was a symbolic assault on the autocracy itself. Determined once and for all to stamp his authority on the unruly political prisoners in his charge, on the 26th of October, the Governor General of the Priamorsk uh, region, uh, this is General uh, Adjutant Baron Alexander uh, Korf, an office, he had this office with direct responsibility for the political prisoners uh, at Kara, um, ordered a clampdown in the prison. The prisoners were to be put on normal convict rations and deprived of reading and writing materials. Troublemakers, he wrote, are to be subjected to corporal punishment without the slightest concession. Most scandalous for the revolutionaries, Korf ordered that Sigida receive 100 strokes of the birch rod. The impression made by this uncompromising disregard of the traditional exemption of both educated Russians and women from corporal punishment is difficult to overstate. 
Amidst widespread public opposition to the use of corporal punishments, even on c common criminals, to flog prisoners drawn from the educated ranks of Russian society was to transgress accepted moral standards. To subject a young woman to the birch rod was to perpetrate an atrocity. The Kara physician refused either to sanction or to attend the flogging in view of Sigida's poor health. Undeterred, the, the authorities proceeded with the punishment in the absence of a doctor on the 7th of November, 1889. In the moments before the flogging, Sigida declared that the punishment was for her the equivalent of a death sentence and lay down voluntarily beneath the birch. These were not empty words. After she was returned to her cell later that day, Sigida and three fellow women prisoners poisoned themselves. So they, they overdosed on morphine. Sigida died that evening and the others over the course of the next two days. When news of the flogging reached the other political prisoners in Kara, the suicidal protests spread. Within a week, seven prisoners in the men's prison had also attempted to overdose with morphine. More followed their example. In total, some 20 prisoners took poison and six died. The fatal drama that played out in Kara was a public contest between the revolutionaries and the state over control of the prisoners' bodies. For the authorities, corporal punishment was a justified and legal punishment sanctioned by the laws of the empire. A sentence of penal labor stripped the convict of all rights of rank, including estate-based exemption from corporal punishment. So to flog a prisoner was to uphold the legal power of the state and to affirm the sovereign's annihilation of the penal laborer's former status as a subject endowed with rights. For the revolutionaries, the flogging was an assault on their dignity and a demonstration of the unlimited tyranny of the state. The radicals denied the government the right to punish them physically, and in so doing, they denied the authorities the right to treat them as common criminals. By taking their own lives, Sigida and her fellow revolutionaries used corporal punishment as a spectacle to, un to underline the illegitimate violence of the autocracy. The Kara tragedy, as it was quickly dubbed, dealt a body blow to the moral authority and legitimacy of the Tsarist empire in its struggle with the revolutionary movement. Upon his return to the United States from his travels in Siberia, the journalist and explorer George Kennan reported on the case to a horrified audience and his fierce criticisms of the exile system fed a rising tide of sympathy for the revolutionaries abroad. <coughs> Kennan lectured to audiences on the exile system, often appearing on stage with half his head shaved and clad in rags and chains in the manner of a Siberian convict. At his lecture in Boston in 1890, Mark Twain rose from his seat and tearfully exclaimed, if such a government cannot be overthrown otherwise than by the use of dynamite, then thank God for dynamite. The Siberian Exile uh, Association had chapters in 50 American cities in the 1890s and gathered over one million signatures on petitions protesting the Tsarist treatment of political prisoners. And in London, there, was, there were sort of very large demonstrations um, uh, on Hyde Park Corner, um, numbering several thousand um, in support of uh, Siberia's uh, political prisoners, and indeed, sort of um, well, well, I mean, pr proven revolutionaries. There's, I mean, what, one uh, one individual, Stepniak Kravchinsky, who um, assassinated the head of the Tsarist secret police uh, in uh, 1880. Um, and you know, penned um, the not terribly apologetic pamphlet A Death for a Death uh, a few weeks later, um, was welcomed into the drawing rooms of um, you know, sort of the uh, educated um, uh, Londoners uh, in the 1880s um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of celebrated um, freedom fighter. So this, this image, which actually is a little earlier, um, it's from the early 1880s, it's published in a British uh, satirical uh, magazine um, sort of captures something of the of the way in which um, many in um, 
Europe and uh, the United States um, viewed uh, the Russian government um, in, this, uh, in this period. Um, ironically, Kennan had actually been given permission by the Tsarist authorities to travel freely in Siberia because he had, prior to his departure, penned an article that was sympathetic to the Tsarist government, saying that they were confronted with a, you know, a host of dangerous fanatics and of course, you know, you can't you can't deal with these people um, while wearing um, velvet gloves. And it was only when he reached Siberia uh, that um, he became convinced that you know um, thousands of those who had been exiled were um, simply men and women um, who you know had legitimate aspirations to play a role in the kind of the you know the civil society and the and the political uh, administration of their of their country um and the you know the, there was nothing uh, dangerous uh, or fanatical about them in the 1880s and 1890s then exile had been reserved for a narrow sectarian elite as i said the there were only around 4000 um exiles um uh, who'd been sent to siberia for um political crimes um, among a, a total number of about 300,000. But the 1905 revolution uh, changed all of that. It cleaved Nicholas's, Nicholas II's reign in two. From its secret printing presses, safe houses, plots, and congresses abroad, the revolutionary movement erupted across the empire. Faced with a campaign of terrorism, an insurgent peasantry, and large-scale urban unrest, the state turned to the exile system as to a weapon in its struggle with the revolutionaries. Sealed convict trains began to transport tens of thousands of political exiles across the Urals. The number of penal laborers in the empire leapt from 6,000 in 1905 to 30,000 by 1910. And by 1907, two hostile camps faced, were facing off in Siberia's now dreadfully overcrowded prisons. On the one side, there were zealous new prison warders keen to stamp the authority of the state on their unruly prison population. And on the other were the prisoners themselves who had been blooded in the strikes, mutinies, terrorist campaigns, and rural unrest of the revolution. An official report in, in 1906 observed that Today's penal laborer is more self-regarding and more attached to his own freedoms. He is more conscious in the defense of his dignity. And what united most, if not all, prisoners was now a visceral hatred of authority. Many, too, had little to lose. Of the 600 men and women who were serving out terms of penal labor in the Taborsk prison, um, which is, this is the... So this is the, this is the Kremlin, uh, this is the prison building here. So it spans, this is the main square in the town. This is a picture actually I should, I should um, you know, credit where it's due, um, Dmitry Medvedev, um, Russian prime minister, um, who um, obviously has a, a hobby um, of taking mm -hmm. aerial photographs of windswept Russian cities. Um, so, but this, this, uh, this prison building spans the central square uh, in the, uh, in the uh, town. And the archive actually is this, this building just over here. So it was, it was a sort of thrillingly proxim proximate place to be doing the research. Um, of the 600 men and women who were serving out terms of penal labor in Taborsk in 1909, 60% had been sentenced to uh, terms of between eight and 20 years and 12% to lifelong penal labor. In the wake of the 1905 revolution, the politics of protest and the embrace of martyrdom in Siberia was about to give way to the violence of armed struggle. Rising tensions in the Taborsk prison were fueled by wider government repression across the empire and soon erupted into open confrontation. The detonator here was once again the flogging of political prisoners. Following the mass suicide in Kara in 1889, both warders and prisoners understood the symbolic significance of the act. On the 16th of July, 1907, the revolutionaries in the Taborsk prison learned of the birching of three of their comrades and outraged a group of 16 of them resolved to mutiny and handed a declaration to the warden, Bogoyavlyansky, that was explicit in its invocation of notions of despotism, natural rights, and justice. <clears throat> 
And they wrote, having learned of the punishment of three of our comrades, we declare that with this act, the Taborsk administration has thrown down the gauntlet to all political prisoners. We take up that gauntlet and declare that we prefer a bloody death at the hands of unbridled tyrants to the disgrace of the mockery and insult to those sacred rights of every man and citizen. The following day, having armed themselves with bed planks and furniture legs, the 16 political prisoners refused to allow warders to enter their cells to search them. On Bogoyavlensky's orders, soldiers and guards stormed the cells, and in the process, the nervous soldiers opened fire on the rioting prisoners. By the time the frantic orders to cease fire were obeyed, one prisoner, Semyonov, lay dead from a gunshot wound to the head, and seven others had been injured. The battles being fought in Siberia's jails soon spilled out beyond their walls and into its towns and cities. Warders and guards might have had the upper hand inside the cells and courtyards of the prison, but when they stepped out into the street, they were extremely vulnerable to determined, well-organized and ruthless assassins. The very day of the flogging of the three political prisoners, a brief note had been posted to Bogoyavlensky. We have learned that you have cruelly treated our comrades among the political and criminal exiles, and for that we are serving you with a death sentence that we shall carry out without delay. The note was signed incognito. Actually, in Russian, kind of, I mean, it, 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 with the word incognito not translated into Russian. So. Two weeks later, an unknown assassin shot Bogoyavlensky dead as he sat in his carriage in the city park before fleeing in the ensuing confusion. The murdered warder's replacement, a man called Ivan Magiliev, was determined to now bring the town's unruly prisoners to heel. He ordered that all the prisoners be fettered, that all their heads be shaved, and that had, he had any who resisted uh, flogged. Taborsk became known as the realm of the birch. On the 7th of January 1908, an attempt by the prison warders to remove an insubordinate prisoner to the punishment cells elicited a storm of protest among more than a dozen of his cellmates. When Magiliev was summoned to the cell and ordered the ringleaders arrested, a move that only fanned the flames of the riot throughout the prison, he assembled reinforcements and demanded that the men be dragged from their cells, but this time the guards suffered losses of their own. Seven prisoners were injured, but one managed to seize a revolver and firing on the guards killed one and wounded another. In March 1908, the 13 prisoners in the mutinous cell were tried for murder by a military tribunal in the grounds of the prison. They were convicted of conspiring to murder their guards and of, pre, and of premeditated murder and were sentenced to death. The military governor withheld clemency and the 13 were hanged in the courtyard of the Taborsk prison. Vengeance for the hangings was slow in coming, but come it surely did. Magiliev survived for a full year and a half as the master of the Taborsk prison, but he was now a marked man. Despite reservations among some in the local party leadership that an assassination would only intensify repression of their comrades behind bars, a socialist revolutionary named Nikolai Shishmerev traveled to Taborsk in April 1909. He loitered outside the prison on the bustling square, and when Magiliev arrived, he walked up to him and shot him dead. Arrested and sentenced to hang, Shishmerev succeeded in taking poison and died on the eve of his own execution. Magiliev was meanwhile buried next to the grave of his predecessor, Bogiavlensky, in the town cemetery. Some three centuries after Boris Godunov had exiled the insurgent Uglichens and their silenced bell to political oblivion in Taborsk, the town had now become what one contemporary journalist termed an open arena of political struggle. So actually, the, um, it even got to the stage where the, the prison warders would um, leave. So there were rumors circulating in the town that the prisoners were being placed on starvation rations. And uh, the uh, warden, uh, Magiliev, um, uh, placed examples of the food that was being provided to the prisoners in front of the prison gates in an effort to sort of keep keep their local population uh, on side. Um, and the prisoners would stage uh, very noisy protests, sort of clattering pots and pans and 
metal objects against the bars of their cells to sort of raise a din that was apparently audible sort of across uh, the uh, center of the town. So the, 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 the prison became almost a sort of a, um, a, a, a kind of site of, 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 um, of political theater um, uh, during this period. Siberia's prisons proved indispensable weapons against the government's campaign, so in the government's campaign to crush the 1905 revolution. But now crammed with embittered and hostile revolutionaries, they also became incubators of the vengeful and implacable hatred that would erupt across the empire in 1917. On the 1st of July, 1910, a military tribunal in Taborsk sentenced an obscure political prisoner, Sergei Vilkov, to death for his alleged part in the murder of a prison guard. Vilkov was returned to his cell at four o'clock in the afternoon and sat down to write a final note to the prison authorities. Anticipating that his death sentence might very well be commuted to lifelong penal labor, which, which was an established practice, it was partly an, an attempt um, to sort of uh, in, in this public relations um, struggle um, that, in which the regime was engaged um, to sort of persuade the um, you know, wider population of its, of its sort of mo moral authority. And it was, of course, also a demonstration of kind of sovereign power, the, the, the granting of life. Anticipating that his death sentence might very well be commuted to lifelong penal labor, Vilkov refused both the state's justice and the Tsar's clemency. And he wrote, you have seized power, but there will come a time for you hangmen. You are the brigands and the murderers, not those on whom you sit in judgment. You have sentenced me to death for nothing, but I am finished with you. I know how to hang myself and I can manage without your hangman. I no longer wish to live, even though my death sentence will be replaced by penal labor, at least I will no longer see tyranny. Vilkov died in the fervent belief that the, that the sovereignty of the autocracy would eventually be stripped away and its corrupt core exposed. At that moment, the deluded supporters of the regime would turn on the ruler and the authority of the Tsar would be exposed for the conjuring trick that it really was. And he continues, you thieves and murderers rejoice that you have seized so much power. The peasants feed you and you rule over them thanks to the dark masses of soldiers. But there will come a time when they see you for the swindlers, thieves, murderers, and debauchees that you are, and then you will be shown no mercy. Vilkov tied a length of rope to a ring in the wall that supported his bed, and while lying on the floor and with a terrible resolve, he slowly strangled himself to death. Vilkov not only refused clemency, he also vowed never to grant it. No quarter was asked, but neither would any be given. And indeed, once they had seized power, the Bolsheviks would show their own enemies, including the imperial family, no mercy. The Tsar, whose sovereign gift of life Vilkov had spurned, would himself die in a Siberian cellar in a hail of revolutionary bullets. Thank you. We have uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. If you want to step up to the microphone, please, so that your questions can be heard and recorded. If anybody wants to begin. Ah, good. Um, I w wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about how you became interested in this topic and how the project unfolded, and in particular, the uh, what a daunting task of the uh, the research that must have gone into it. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. Um, that's a refreshing question. Um, so actually, I came I, so I came to this because my my background is actually in um, in Russian literature, um, and I I I, I think I've. Um, you know, I sort of, I, I, I fell in love in a horribly pretentious way with Dostoevsky when I was about 15, um, and I never kind of, I've never really shaken him loose. Um, and I think it's sort of um, the, the Siberia as a, as a, as a, as, as a kind of mythic place um, 
sort of cuts through lo lots of the kind of great Russian novels um, of the 19th century and, of course, into the 20th uh, as well. Um, so I suppose I, w I was interested to kind of explore what what lay behind that. Um, so, you know, sort of taking, you know, Dostoevsky's notes, um, notes from the House of the Dead, from, you know, from whom I shamelessly pilfered my title, um, to sort of, you know, to sort of excavate what, what that was like. Um, and yeah, the research was um, it was very slow. Um, it, it, I was I, I did about fifteen months of of research in um, Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, but then also three Siberian cities, one of which was Tobolsk. Um, and it is like panning for gold. I mean, the the the, the archives are very poorly catalogued in most places. So, you know, you you have a files that you know helpfully tell you that they contain correspondence about exiles but it might be it might be something about deliveries of shoes or bed linen you know lasting hundreds of pages or it, they sometimes you find these fantastic sort of individual um, stories so I, I suppose what I tried to do with the book was to, to tell to kind of humanize the you know the, the kind of the large canvas of, of of the exile system through a focus on kind of individuals um, who were caught up in it. And of course that has its own frustrations because um, very large numbers of people who were illiterate um, left no written record. I mean, fragments of their lives sort of are recorded in police reports or, you know, if they give testimony in a court case or they escape. But you know, many of them do just sort of va you know vanish. I mean, they've kind of vanished from the historical um, record. So I was sort of conscious, of not wanting to tell the story only of educated Russians, um, you know, whose experiences, for good or or for for bad, were in in many ways very different. Um, you know, from 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 sort of rank and file peasants and merchants. So. You mentioned um, an American named George Kennan, who seemed to be very active in the late yeah. 1800s. Uh, is or was he at all related to the George Kennan? The who, other George Kennan. Yes, in 1947. Yeah, he's his uncle. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, and for those who yeah. don't know, in, in, invented the, uh, with Paul Nitze the containment policy that right. uh, basically dictated the Cold War. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a specific question, maybe even something more general. I mean, you spoke about how this whole system led to the rise of revolutionary sentiment and hatred of the Tsarist regime. And then at the very end, you speak specifically about the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, the Tsar was overthrown before the, the Bolsheviks. So, so my specific question is, you know, what is the relationship between the, in Siberia? between the broader revolutionary sentiment and hatred of this whole penal regime and the specific you know, ideology of uh, Bolshevism. I, I, maybe, I have another question, which maybe just be more naive. I mean, you, know, you spoke about the, how they realized the system was failing. Mm -hmm. You said they, it's like sort of a slow motion wreck, which they saw. Was there ever any consideration of settlement I don't know, like the Wild West was settled, since you spoke about the Wild, you know, with, without exile, without the penal, through some type of incentives, or was just, that just off the table? Um, okay, so I'll flip the questions around. So the, um, yeah, so what's actually happening is that the, so the, um, the exile population is sort of one part of this wider attempt to colonize Siberia. It is being colonized far more effectively by peasants who are just moving there uh, as, as, as vo vo I mean, sort of, this was difficult to say, sort of vo vo voluntary in, in any kind of pure sense. But um, certainly with the, with the opening up of the Trans-Siberian Railway, um, and I mean, even before that, really, the numbers of, of uh, Russian, sort of land-hungry Russian peasants who are moving to Siberia um, is accelerating. So there are hundreds of thousands moving every year by the end of the 1880s. So the exile system has become a complete anachronism. I mean, it's 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 only detrimental to um, to this wider campaign of of, of um, colonization. Um, on the first question. Um, 
So the Exile system, uh, so many, I think of the leading, I, I'm not quite sure how one qualifies leading Bolshevik, but let, let's just sort of use the word term in a, in a lazy sense. Um, of the leading uh, 100 Bolsheviks in 1917, I think about 65 were former exiles. So exile actually becomes a kind of a badge of honor and a sort of rite of passage. I mean, it's a wellspring of revolutionary authority um, after 1917. Um, the exile system implodes in, in 1917, um, so there are massive escapes, uh, exile is formally abolished in April 1917, and whatever is left of the system just gets torn up by the civil war. Um, but the Bolsheviks sort of in, inherit, I mean, if your question is also about the continuity, like what, you know, what, what happens across the revolutionary divide, um, I think there are two sort of principal continuities. One is that the Bolsheviks inherit a similar set of dilemmas. You know, Siberia remains a very underpopulated, resource-rich area, which, which has very large, inhospitable tracts of ter <coughs> territory. How do you populate them? And how do you contain crime and um, subversion within the Soviet state? So what the Bolsheviks end up doing is sort of re-establishing and then radically expanding um, penal labor um, as a form of punishment in the 1930s. Many of the these sort of smaller penal labor sites that were established under the Tsarist regime become sort of major camps um, under the Bolsheviks. And I think also the Bolsheviks inherit something of the kind of penal imagination of their Tsarist forebears, you know, sort of the idea that, and you still have this in Russia today, that when you are, if you are, if, if the state wants to punish you, it sends you a long, long way away, you know, so this idea of kind of distance and, 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 and removal from native, native lands, making you effectively inaccessible to friends, family, and so on. So I think it's something which, um, that there are strong continuities there. But I, but I, I wouldn't, um, and I, 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 I've always kind of sort of tiptoed around this issue because I, I didn't want to write a book that was understood to be basically the prequel to the gulag, you know, that sort of everything needs to be funneled through 1917. And I think this was a very interesting and important period on its own terms, but I understand that it's, it's, a, it's an entirely kind of legitimate um, question. And what I certainly didn't want to do was to suggest to somehow relativize what happened, you know, in the 1930s or, or, or 40s. I mean, if I, had to, if I had to pick a period in which to be in exile in Siberia, I would emphatically choose the 19th rather than the 20th century. Um, not that I'd ever want to make that choice. Thank you very much indeed for both your presence among us and for your sobering, uh, scary presentation, really. Um, I, my, I also had a question about the sort of institutional, uh, I had two questions, about the institutional continuity. We know that some czarist institutions, like the NKVD, secret police, in many cases, uh, the employees of which worked in the GPU and there was, there was a strong sort of institutional continuity there. So um, I don't know. Uh, my second question is about Jews how, and how much of the prison population were Jews? I mean, there are wisps um, of, uh, you know, some of the, uh, in, in the poetry of Akhmatova or uh, uh, in the writings of later uh, Brodsky, for example, uh, but is there, uh, I can't remember now, having read Dostoevsky's House of the Dead, I don't know whether he notes the presence, uh, I can't remember whether he notes but he, do, he does, and, and in extremely, you know, kind of in, 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 in terms that one wouldn't want to, um, <laughs> yes. to kind of, you know, sort of rehearse. Um, yeah, so the Jew, so Jew, so many of the revolutionaries that I, I I talk about in the sort of closing chapters of the book um, are a significant number of them are Jews. I mean, certainly Jew, Jews are disproportionately represented within the exile population. So they tend to be politically radicalized um, Jews, Poles, Latvians. Um, so the sort of the non, you know non-Russian minorities, but of of the non-Russian minorities, Jews are certainly the majority. Um, I haven't found, and again, it's very difficult to know whether it it might be there, but I didn't come across it. I didn't come across um, 
evidence of sort of institutionalized racism within the exile system. I mean, the, you know, sort of the Jew, Jews are regarded as dangerous because they are revolutionaries, but they're not regarded as more dangerous than other, you know, other, other groups that I've, I've, I've just mentioned. And I haven't come across examples of particularly unpleasant forms of punishment being meted out to Jews because they're Jews. Um, so, you know, you were, I mean, m most of those who fetched up in Siberia were, 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 were not observant, so their kind of religious practices were not, were not an issue. Um, but um, uh, Catholics, um, uh, Muslim uh, prisoners were, were, were all given permission to, you know, to pray, and they, you know, they, 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 they had sort of pastoral um, pastoral and spiritual provision Com made 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 for them. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, I, mean, I think it's. Um, so the the exile system is certainly um, it's one that very looms very large in the history of the Jewish population in late imperial Russia. Um, but I don't. I don't think that Jews as a group suffered disproportionate. Um, persecution because of their Jewishness rather than because of their involvement in the revolutionary movement, if that makes sense. Thank you. Daniel, I have a question and a request. The question is, to what extent is everything you've described known in Russia, written about in Russia, available in Russian textbooks and Russian history books? My request is this. When I had the privilege of being on the jury that chose your book last year, that first slide that you had, mm -hmm. could you put that up yeah, and sure. just explain to those who might not know what that slide is? Because of all the things in your book that stuck with me, that image and what you described stands out above all. Okay, um, so I'll talk about the slide first. Right? So, so this is um, so this this is the uh, this is the boundary post um, which marks. Um, the division between European Russia and uh, Siberia. So it's on the border of Perm and Taborsk province, um, and it, it stands next to the, the the Siberian, the Great Siberian Post Road. So on the way to Taborsk, this is where um, prisoners sort of took took leave of. Europe, effectively. So the painting is called Farewell Europe. It's painted by a, um, a Polish, um, a, a Polish uh, exile to Siberia, Alexander Sokarczewski, who was exiled um, in uh, 1864 um, in the wake of the 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 the, quash, the, the, the sort of quashing of the of the of the uh, Polish rebellion uh, against um, St. Petersburg. And it depicts it depicts a group of poles, um, you know, many of them accompanied by their their wives, um, as they as they sort of take um, take leave of Europe. Some of them, I've been told not to point at the screen. Some of them over here. So there's one guy here who is um, etching his his initials or his name into the post. And George Kennan, writing about the same um, spot, describes. Um, exiles taking soil, sort of handfuls of soil, and stuffing it into their pockets, and sort of taking it, uh, taking it with them uh, to to Siberia. So, I mean, the, I think this, I mean, that's sort of less romantically the significance of this spot does, of course, change as the 19th century progresses, and, and sort of you know um, infrastructure begins to kind of erase the the um, the scale of the kind of chasm, if you like, between Europe and Siberia in the popular imagination. But certainly, um, for you know, right through, I would say, until the 1870s, um, you know, for many Russians, Siberia is is a it's a place that is no less remote than Botany Bay was to you know the kind of denizens of of of, of Georgian England. Um, so when the Decembrists cross it. One of them says that you know he knows that he's now going to live beyond the, civ the frontiers of the civilized world, you know that his life has ended. Um, so that's this particular um, uh, picture. Um, the, um, so in Russia there is a kind of that there, there is an existing historiography of the um, of the exile system, but it really focuses primarily on the Decembrists um, as kind of heroes and martyrs. 
Um, it, you know, the Decembrists were kind of um, uh, sort of wheeled out by the Bolsheviks um, um, it, at various stages um, uh, as um, sort of um, n noble forebears of the revolution and also um, the Decembrist wives um, as kind of exemplars of sort of, you know, loyal, loyal women. So that's the kind of the, 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 the sort of feminine um, ideal. Um, much less is said about um, criminal uh, exiles. And I mean, it, it is, it, I mean, really, it's a, it's a curiously under-researched um, topic. Um, so um, my, I mean, my, my, my book, although it has been translated, is very popular with the Poles, apparently, my book. <laughs> Um, but there, but there, 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 there are no plans to have it translated into Russian, um, so nobody is interested. Yeah. We have time for one last question okay. before we break into the more informal part of the evening. So, so. Oh well, I've got two, I've got two questions, oh, uh, but they're they're they're, 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 sh they're they're sort of connect they're connected in short. Um, first, it's it's the, the, the you mentioned the the, the mines in in Nerchinsk and and the. How, do, how, do, how does the role of extraction of resources fit in? With, with, are these people being banished and yet some, some, there's some allocation towards the resources? And second, could you, I mean, maybe not something you know about or start, or looked at, but how does colonization compare in Siberia uh, and the conceptualization of space to colonization, particularly in places like Central Asia, where in the same period, the expansion of Russian borders, resettlement of large scales of population, and there is some sort of idea that these are new areas that need to be peopled, and therefore, who do you take to dump in those places, because no one really wants to go? Yeah, um, so uh, th there are, um, at, at, at the various um, sort of industrial sites, I mean, so, you know, some of these are penal distilleries, there are mines, there are kind of logging operations, construction projects. Um, the, the, uh, the exiles, you know, do, I mean, they, obviously they work, I mean, they are, they are put to work, but the administrators are constantly bombarding Petersburg with requests to send them not exiles, but voluntary laborers, because the exiles spend all of their time trying to, you know, do as little as possible. So um, the uh, uh, exile as a form, so exile labor is, um, is extremely inefficient, um, and really by, kind of by the 18, 70s, it's not really even being deployed e effectively anywhere because it's been supplanted and overtaken by um, by peasant labour um, uh, instead. Um, so the um, czarist administrators are are sort of extremely critical of the institution of forced labour. As, as one that is not really, I mean, it's more trouble than it's worth, it costs more than it produces, uh, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, on the, on the, on the issue of, of the, the kind of wider colonial um, framework, that's, that's interesting. I think um, there's, there, there's quite a lot of ambivalence about um, in Central Asia as well, about the ability of the Russian peasants, peasant colonists, to actually undertake this kind of transformative mission. You know that actually they are um, uh, they are not as effective. You know that sort of officialdom is disappointed by the by 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 in places like Turkestan is are sort of disappointed by the results. Um, but I haven't come across direct. Discussions of, I mean, as far as I'm aware, penal labour is not used in places like Turkestan. Um, so, I mean, there, there are discrete sites um, in the Caucasus, but they are gradually wound down before sort of my period uh, begins. But yeah, it's an interesting question. I, so, the short answer is I don't really know, um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting question um, how the two relate to each other. Well, the discussion, it will be really two words, uh, the discussion tonight and this afternoon reminded us uh, with sort of frightening certainty how and to what extent the mechanisms of power as punishment and coercion continue to function with frightening similarity across the times and across the space. So these are issues of continuous relevance. And uh, therefore, I hope you join me in thanking Professor Beer for bringing this, um, well, this talk to us 
uh, and for the truly stimulating and thought-provoking uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you.